Welcome everyone. I'm Robert Saltzman, author of The 10,000 Things, and this is The 10,000 Things Zoom for September 2nd, 2018. It's my great pleasure to have with me today a dear friend, Joan Tollison. And Joan is the author of another wonderful book, which I'm going to display here because I want to encourage anyone with an interest in these matters to read this as soon as possible. This is just about the clearest exposition of non-duality without uh, getting into the, the weeds that I've encountered. It's really a, a lovely book and, and beautifully written to boot. Um, just about the time that Joan was working on this book, I was doing some writing of my own and I am struck by how close Joan and I were back in 2011 when she was working on this. At my thoughts at the time about this entire field um, are expressed pretty well in this book, actually. It's surprising. And now in speaking with Joan, I find that the two of us now, um, years later, have moved in other directions, and yet we're still on the same page, the two of us which is a move away from this kind of marketplace non-duality, which makes definitive statements such as consciousness creates the body. And, and then this will be said as if it's a known fact and no one could possibly dispute such a thing. And actually, I think when we get deeply into it, that will just be nonsense and we'll have to understand this in a much more profound way. Um, and we'll have to understand that consciousness is not something that a human being can really define. It's something that we live with. It's, it's like a friend. <laughs> you, you live with it and you get to know it, but you can't control it or define it. You don't really know what that is. So with that as introduction, let me turn this over to Joan for her thoughts on the matter. Well, thank you so much for having me, Robert. Um... I, uh, I just read your book, The 10,000 Things, for the second time recently, and I loved it even more than I did the first time. And again, it had a very powerful impact on me, as has our friendship, and um, I'm very grateful for that, and uh, looking forward to this opportunity to, uh, to talk with you. Uh, I've kind of written recently about my my descent from transcendent spirituality down into the bowels of the human experience. And maybe I can say a little bit about what I mean by that and what that's been for me. Um, that might be a good place to sort of leap off. Um, you know, I started out in Zen, and, which is very down to earth. And then I got involved with Tony Packer, who was a former Zen teacher who had left the ritual and dogma and all of that behind. And, um, and she was very much about looking at what goes on in our minds and in our ordinary lives. And she also did talk about spacious awareness and presence and this kind of spacious openness um, and the awareness that can see our conditioning and so on. So um, if that's what we mean by the transcendent, then you know a kind of waking up from the story of my life which was the subtitle of my first book, <laughs> Waking Up from the Story of My Life and Discovering that there's this bigger, bigger picture in which we are the whole happening, um, then I can resonate with that. But um, where it kind of feels off to me is where what you mentioned, where people kind of turn it into these metaphysical ideas that are then presented as fact and where awareness gets kind of reified into this thing that the me is now trying to identify as awareness rather than as a person. And people are saying things like, I, I know I'm not my body and I know I'm not my mind. And, and I feel like you are your body, <laughs> you are your mind. I mean, it's not, you're not encapsulated inside the body and the body isn't the separate, solid, separate, independent thing that we think it is. But but to deny the person or the body feels really off to me. So, 
So, um, but I've kind of, you know, ventured into this kind of Advaita metaphysical transcendent realm a number of times in my journey. Um, I think I first was introduced to it when I was actually on staff at Tony's place at Springwater and uh, somebody who was passing through uh, introduced me to both John Klein and the Sargadatta. And I read, I am that. And I uh, ended up going on a number of retreats with John Klein. And then over the years I was in, you know, attended events with or got involved with a number of satsang teachers like Gangaji and Muji and Francis Lucille, Rupert, and um, and most recently, I had um, for a for a while I had a lovely friendship with a young man who was just starting out in his satsang teaching career, and um, I got quite uh, caught up in in his perspective, and um, which again was this kind of transcendent Advaita perspective. I don't know that he would describe it that way, but anyway. Um, so last, I guess it was last October at the SAN conference, I was at the Science and Non-Duality conference and uh, my uh, UK publisher, uh, Julian Noyce, lent me a copy of your book, Robert, uh, the 10,000 things to look at during the conference. And so as the conference went along, I was reading your book and it had a very powerful impact on me. And when I got home from the conference, very soon after I was diagnosed with cancer. And uh, it was a, an anal cancer that had invaded my rectum and my vagina and a few other places had lit up on the PET scan also. And I, you know, had surgery, I had a colostomy, and I had radiation and chemotherapy. And so there was this kind of uh, thing where I suddenly had this cancer that was in all the parts of the body that we're not supposed to talk about out loud. <laughs> and, um, and I was literally plunged into, you know, having the, you know, during the radiation, of course, causes burns in the in the vagina and the anus and that whole part of the body and so I was that's where I was experiencing pain and itching and all sorts of things and uh, and I'm dealing with this ostomy bag so I'm literally um, at time at times really literally <laughs> immersed in in poop and so it was a, it was a very kind of graphic <laughs> embodiment of coming from the transcendent into the into the bowels of the human experience, into the nitty gritty um, things that we don't even want to talk about. And at the same time as that's going on, this friendship that I mentioned was, was sort of unraveling and, um, and there was some disillusionment in that for me. And, uh, and in the course of all that, I was really questioning um, this whole kind of transcendent direction um, and just have been moving um, kind of back to my Zen roots, back to not, not back to formal Zen, I don't mean that, but back to, um, and, and um, maybe I shouldn't say back to anything, but, but, but I've been moving away from that kind of, um, desire to come up with a metaphysical conclusion about what this whole thing is. And, and I've been moving away from that whole kind of spirituality that kind of wants to get out of this. Um, and instead, and I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to say that I'm moving away from, I mean, there, there's something very real about sort of connecting with, um, the sense of being aware and present. Um, but it's not about trying to stay in some state of presence all the time or trying to identify me as that and not as a human being. Um, it just feels like there's a really false dualism in there and a kind of um, 
denial of our human experience that um, feels very false to me. And, um, and the other thing with the cancer was just all the love I received from friends and people. And it just really brought home to me the importance of human connection, love. And um, um, so I don't know, I, I'm kind of rambling on here, but maybe that's kind of it says something about how you came into my life and what an important um, part you, I mean, you sort of came in at the perfectly synchronistic moment <laughs> for my descent uh, into the bowels of the human experience. <laughs> well, it's an honor. <laughs> <laughs> when, you, when you have to deal with a lot of shit, call Robert. <laughs> well, yeah, and I know you've dealt with a lot of it, too. <laughs> well, I have, you know. I've dealt with some illness in my life, too, so I certainly understand. Uh, that's a very special state of mind. And uh, although it has some horrible aspects to it, serious illness does, it also can be very... Uh, helpful, I would say, in understanding certain things that without the illness, I don't think I would understand those things. So th those are almost like a little built-in gift, aren't they? That, that... They are. I mean, I think of it, I, I've really seen it as an awakening journey. Um, hmm. What would you say for you um, it has? Um... Well, I, I have a condition that... Um, it's a chronic autoimmune condition, and it's quite serious, um, usually fatal, and um, it can go south any time. I mean, right now I'm maintaining with the with a drug regimen uh, protocol, and it's working pretty well. Um, but um, I've had some bad spells already where where it wasn't working well, and and that can happen any at any time. So that may sound dire, but I've actually found it liberating. Um, it just helps to wake up in the morning and have to deal with exactly what you have to deal with and know that this might be the last day. It just mm -hmm. focuses everything, and I, I've, I've really found it helpful. I'm not saying that anyone should wish to be in this condition. If I could switch it off again, well, that's an inter interesting question. I'm not, I'm not actually sure that I would. That's, that's how much I've learned from it. And um, one of the things I'd like to point out about this transcendence, um, transcendence aspect of, of uh, 21st century spirituality is that it's mostly about avoidance, in my opinion. It's mostly about avoiding knowing that without this body, there is no Robert. So although awareness is certainly real, and um, there's no denying that, but I would not say that awareness creates this body, which is what I hear from um, a lot of experts. Uh, they want to believe that they are not the body, at all. They have no relationship to it. They don't really need their body for anything. The body's like a burden. And what they really are is pure awareness. And to me, that's just the lie that people tell themselves. No one has any way of knowing that or even knowing what pure awareness is or what it would be like. What we know is human awareness. That's what we're dealing with. And if there's going to be any spirituality at all, in my view, it should deal with human awareness, with human being, and with the being of the other sentient creatures on this planet. Not with the idea of getting somewhere else, but with the idea of being right here. Yes. Yeah, I mean, because that's where we are. I mean, that's what is this right here, you know, just this. And it's like, yeah, and these cert there are certain ideas that, that float around out there that I've never really bought, like that the whole notion that awareness or consciousness is unchanging, that it's sort of like, and I might even have said these things at some point, but I mean that 
awareness is often compared or consciousness is compared to the screen that the movie is playing on and that, you know, that it's the unchanging background of the changing world. And, and I don't have any experience of awareness apart from experience. I mean, I can kind of feel into as an experience, I can kind of feel into a kind of sense of, you know, there's an awareness of this happening and there's, and then there's an awareness of being aware and, you know, I can kind of feel into the subtlety, the nothingness, the emptiness of that or whatever. But, um, and interestingly in Zen, emptiness has such a different meaning. I mean, in Zen, emptiness is interdependence. It's, it's the insubstantiality, the fluidity, the, the, um, of everything, it's not like some sort of big empty space. But, but, um, but anyway, I mean, I don't have an experience of awareness. Like, I've I had a big discussion with Rupert at one point because you know he was saying that that there is no no one has an experience of awareness or consciousness disappearing, and and I said, but I do. I mean, whenever I've gone under anesthesia, I have a I just can I feel consciousness or experience slipping away and then there's nothing there and then I'm in the recovery room <laughs> and you know it's um it may be true that consciousness is the ground of being and that there's nothing but consciousness I mean I'm not saying that isn't true but I don't see how we can know that I don't even know what consciousness is I mean it on the one hand it's sort of our most like this the, the knowingness of being present and having experience is consciousness I and mean, that's what we call consciousness but but we don't really what is that and and it doesn't seem to me like it's i can separate it from the from the so-called content and it doesn't seem like there's any me separate from it and it doesn't seem like it's unchanging in fact it's just the opposite it seems like it's nothing but continuous change mm -hmm. Well, that movie screen metaphor has confused countless people. Mm. I, it's, I, it has a use. There is a use to it. But the use is right at the beginning. You know, I did spiritual teaching for a couple of years for my sins. <laughs> and uh, I'm so glad to not be doing that um, kind of thing. But people were coming to me, and a lot of them were beginners. Um, and I use that metaphor about the movie screen because it helps at first to understand um, mindfulness. It helps to split. It's an it's an it's it's a, an initial move. Yeah. You're going to split something that really can't be split, just so that someone just so that someone will understand that you don't have to be caught up in the movie. There's a way to regard one's life. Yes, the life is going on, but there's a way of observing it mm -hmm. also. However, <laughs> that, that metaphor has confused people who stick with it. It's something that should be used for a moment and then discard it. What I see in a lot of spiritual teachers, uh, you mentioned Rupert, but he's not the only one. They have extracted this idea from, from uh, Hindu metaphysics, um, and they, they want to believe in it for psychological reasons, which I understand. But then they use their intelligence to prove this logically, and it cannot be proved logically. There is no way to stand outside of oneself in that way and to know anything about these deep matters, I say. The essence of my work, I would say, if it comes down to a couple of a couple of points, that's one of the major points that there is a limit to human knowledge. And when people talk about knowing jnana and all of this, they really jump the shark. The first thing is to find out where the limit is, and then have the conversation within those epistemological limits. Before I turn it back to you, that's a very good word that just popped up, epistemological. And I want to just share that with anyone who's uh, watching this and doesn't know that word, because it's a really good word for anyone who's interested in spirituality. 
Epistemology is the science or the study of what we know and how we can know it. Mm -hmm. And what I see in, in spirituality is there is really no epistemological humility at all. Things are, uh, someone will make a statement, a teacher will make a statement, and the students will all nod their heads, oh, truth, that's truth, that's truth. Really? And you, you've examined this thoroughly, and how? How do you know that's truth? Because the teacher says so? Well, if, you, if that is your standard, if that's your epistemological standard, you're an idiot. <laughs> and you'll remain an idiot. So what I have written about basically is to question everything, especially one's pet beliefs and one's, one's favorite ideas. And mm -hmm. people don't like that idea, but I've applied it to myself for years. I've doubted everything, everything about Robert. Whatever Robert thought, I would say, really? Um, based on what, Robert? And as a result of that process, Joan, I have discarded everything. And it's fine being without it. I have no beliefs, no spiritual beliefs, and positive or negative. I mean, like when Rupert says um, consciousness creates the body, he might be right. I don't know that he's wrong, but I don't know that he's right. So that's a question that just um, doesn't interest me because there's no answer. Mm -hmm. It's just speculation. Well, I would hesitate to say that I have no beliefs because um, I've discovered sometimes that I have some belief that I haven't seen yet, um, that I'm, you know, still operating under. Oh, thank you but, for the correction. But, uh, that, that's true. What I mean is I have no, I have no outstanding beliefs that I'm embracing right. that, I, that I know about. Right. There's plenty yeah. of unconscious structures that we can call beliefs and we have no access to them. And also, in my experience, the best spirituality, and this is where, you know, maybe we see things a little differently, but to me, um, you know, I'm not completely down on religion and spirituality. I'm down on certain aspects of it because obviously, you know, it does contain a lot of dogmatism and ridiculous beliefs and has been involved in a lot of atrocities and blah, blah, blah. But, um, I also feel like it's provided some really positive things in the world. And um, I think you froze, oh, you are there, okay. We were having a little connection problem there. Um, anyway, um, and, and so to me, it's like religion gets into trouble when it deals with belief because it tends to look at belief as sort of revealed truth that it can't be questioned. And science has the tools to deal with belief in the most effective way. It has the scientific method, which, quest, which puts out a, a hypothesis and then tests it out and is always ready to look beyond it and overturn it. You know? So to me, what, what I like in religion and spirituality and what I resonate with is when it deals with what is with direct experience rather than with these metaphysical ideas and beliefs. So to me, the kind of the spirituality that I've resonated with, like Zen, or of course there's many varieties of Zen, but Zen at its best, um, actually questions beliefs. I mean, it's always, you know, like Suzuki Roshi's famous statement, not always so. You know, it's always about sort of undermining and questioning like the, the, the old koan about the Zen student knocking on the coffin and, and asking the, the teacher, is it dead or alive? And the teacher says, dead or alive, I won't say. You know, it's sort of like not landing in either the absolute or the relative, not landing on either side of the coin. And to me, that's real non-duality. I mean, because, um, you know, it's, it's about not landing on the sort of absolute perspective that you know, there's no me, there's no self, there's, there's nothing, there's just um, vastness or something and not landing on the, on the more relative perspective that I'm a human being in the world and there's, you know, there's climate change and Donald Trump and all of that. 
um, not denying either side of the coin, not getting stuck on either side of the coin and sort of, you know, a lot of um, Zen teaching really sort of points to not knowing, that sort of open, not knowing mind. And that to me is beautiful spirituality. I mean, that's, uh, you know, and, and many of the old Zen masters were sort of engaged in constantly undermining any place where anybody tried to land, including themselves, like they would put out something and then they would negate it and then they would negate the negation. Right. And, right. and I think that's, you know, that's kind of like you mentioned how the, the movie and the screen thing is kind of a useful pointer at a certain point. And I, I agree with that. And I, you know, and it's clear to me that we kind of, I think there is a kind of, even though you could say waking up is, can only be exactly right now, there's also, relatively speaking, a kind of process of unfoldment. And it seems to me that we need, you know, we need different, kind of different things at different moments. And yes, we, yeah, right. I, what's, what's needed, what's needed is coaching, not uh, preaching, and there's a there's a really big difference. Um, as you know, people have been writing to me with questions about all this, and my approach to it is to try to help that person to drop some baggage, not acquire new baggage. And um, I I think you and I are are. Um, on the same page once again in our, our respect for, for Zen. Uh, it's certainly been a, a great thing in my life to encounter these Middle, age, middle Ages um, teachers from the 7th, 8th, 9th centuries. There was a great deal of wisdom there. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very different from Vedanta, very different yeah. from, the, from the Hindu aspect. In fact, I've gotten to the point where I, I reject um, Vedanta entirely. It's not that there's nothing there. There, there. there is some good stuff there, but it's mixed in with so much nonsense, so much religious tradition and religious belief that um, it's really a dangerous substance. I, I, I've said that it's rat poison and people really shouldn't eat it. Because once you get started on that, um, you're going to be assaulted with logic, because that's that's the way that system works. They they set out a couple of a couple of precepts, and then all the rest of it is logical arguments for it. Logical arguments. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you and I would both agree, Joan, that there's logic only goes so far. And there's a, there's a there, there's a point at which, let's say you've got cancer, where you can't really figure it out. You have to just be with it. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is the teaching that, that I that I like from Zen, which is it's about being, not knowing. It's not about knowing. It's about not knowing, but fully engage, engaging in whatever one is engaged with. If it's making um, a dinner, you're present. You're chopping the vegetables. If it's um, speaking with Joan Tollefson, which is a tremendous privilege, I'm just thrilled to to, to have you here. Likewise. Oh, I, I just consider, I'm, I, I'm a fan. I consider you a, a very bright light. And I think a lot of other people do too. So this is a, this is just a nice opportunity to, to speak with you. Um, so when you're speaking with, with Joan Tollefson, then you just have to speak with Joan Tollefson. There's no other agenda. And I really think that that's, if we know that much, then life will be our, our teacher. It mm -hmm. really will. If we just engage in the actual nuts and bolts of life in an honest way, I think we'll find out what we need to find out along the way. And we don't really need someone to constantly be telling us what to think next. Mm -hmm. To me, um, well, you were saying you like religion and spirituality. And some I don't, I don't. Some of what's called spirituality I do like. Um, I just mentioned Zen, and there's, there's other things too. But most of it, almost all of religion, I have no use for that at all, because there's God in that, and I don't believe in God. I don't disbelieve in it either. It's an idea in the human mind 
Um, I think Nisargadatta said that really well. He said, you are not in God, God is in you. And that's, that's how I see it. So if, if a Christian says, you know, Jesus or, or um, a Hindu says Brahman, it's all the same to me. It's a, it's a, it's a uh, fictional character. Um, so I don't, why, why hear about that? Well, I, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I'm, I actually love fiction. <laughs> I mean, I love movies and, uh, you know, plays, theater and novels and, um, myths. Mm. And I don't take these stories completely literally. I mean, I, I think that when you look at a religion, any religion, Buddhism, Christianity, Hinduism, Islam, any religion, there are, are kind of different layers of it. You know, there's the sort of popular layer that, that you know, where there's a lot of superstitious um, literalism and dogma and all that. And then there's more subtle layers of it where, you know, you find the mystics or the theology professors or whatever, you know, the kind of people, monks, the kind of people not, that, that are looking at it in a different way and everything in between. And it's easy to criticize the sort of, you know, popular literal aspects of it because that's pretty stupid. Um, but, um, well, I don't want to, stupid is a nasty word to put on it. I, I, you know, I take that back in a way, but it certainly doesn't feel true to me or appeal to me. Let's put it that way. But this wasn't the kind of religion that, see, I was raised by atheist agnostics and then I got involved in the Christian church as a young person. And, um, it was a very progressive church. I mean, it was what introduced me to the civil rights movement because they brought black people from the inner city in to talk to us. And it was, you know, I asked the minister once, what is God? And, and he said something, I can't even remember, but it was something like, it's energy, like electricity, like the whole universe or something like that was what he said. It wasn't like, oh God, is this guy up in the sky who's, you know, created you and is planning everything and judging you. So I think, for me, and for me, a lot of the ritual in religion is just, I enjoy like singing bhajans and, and the Catholic mass, which I've participated in. I just think it's a beautiful ritual thing. I don't take it literally. I don't, you know, and I don't even, who knows if Jesus even existed? You know, it doesn't matter to me. There, but the story of the crucifixion and the resurrection, which I don't take literally. I mean, he may have really been crucified, but I don't take the resurrection literally. But, but you know, I see that as a kind of mythological story about first he's, he's, you know, he's being tortured basically. And then he's, for his first response is, God, why have you abandoned me? And then it's kind of thy will be done, like he's opening to it. And then out of that, the resurrection. So to me, I take a lot of these things mythologically or symbolically or whatever. And I certainly don't deny that religion has done, you know, enormous damage in the world, but it's also done a lot of great things in the world. Um, you know, like when there's natural disasters, a lot of times it's religious groups that come and and take care of people and help people. And um, so I guess my feelings about it are just a little bit more mixed. And um, you know, and and I don't and and there are and there's so it in, the word religion or spirituality encompasses so much because it's you know on the one hand, I mean even the Catholic Church, which is on the one hand sort of the worst of religion. <laughs> It also includes liberation theology and people like Thomas Merton and David Stendhal Rost, you know, who are amazing. So it's, um, I guess I just, I just see it as a, as a big, as a big field. And there are parts of it that I resonate with very deeply. I, I got into, you know, as a child, I mean, perhaps because my parents were atheist agnostics, I mean, I was inventing religion, you know, when I had to be in my room alone during my nap time, what I was doing was inventing religions. And I, <laughs> I literally was writing scriptures and making these little ornaments and things and, and you know, these ceremonies. And, and I used to, you know, imagine myself becoming a monk. I didn't want to be, you know, I was already sort of little gender fluid in there. I didn't really want to be a nun. I wanted to be a monk. And I kind of realized that was going to be a problem. But, um, but, <laughs> but, you know, and of course I could never really have been a monk because I could never buy all the Catholic dogma. But there's, 
there, I guess I've said enough, you know, that there's something in it to me that's beautiful and I wouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah, I, I respect that. Um, I'm, I'm not sitting in judgment of religion either. I'm just expressing my own attitude towards it. I, I certainly agree with you that there have been some amazing great people who, in, in all religions, mm -hmm. um, very few, but, but some. That's kind yeah. of... That's like Rumi, Rumi, Rumi and Hafiz in Islam, you know, I mean, that's really different from, you know, ISIS or something like that. Yeah, you know? of course, that's, that's true. Yeah. Although, I must say, I don't like Rumi. I, I know that's really strange because everyone loves Rumi, but I, I don't. I, I, Rumi's like a Hallmark card to me. This platitudes, my beloved. See, I, I can't get with that at all. Not at all. Oh, well, I, just, I, love I just don't feel that way. I don't have those feelings. I don't think there's any beloved that I'm supposed to come into contact with or yearn, yearn for, yearn for. That's, I, I just don't have that yearning. When I look within myself, it's not there. Never has been. I, 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 I've been present with this for as long as I, back as I can remember. I mean, um, there's a whole mental side. There's a mental trip going on, and I'm not there. I never have been. Um, in <laughs> fact, I'm going to rather talk about you, but, but, I'll, but I'll say this. The way I got into this whole thing, um, when I say whole thing, I mean what we're doing now and having written a book and all that, is years ago, um, I was living in this town here, dusty little town, um, for about 10 years without saying a word about any of the, these matters to anyone. And I was um, doing psychotherapy and doing my personal photography, and I didn't really think about spirituality, hardly at all, almost never. Um, and then uh, a Buddhist teacher, Dr. Robert Hall, a well-known teacher moved to town here and of course we met and the two of us um, we've become great friends um, he, he's dying at the moment uh, it's going to be a big loss to me I already feel it um, but anyway Robert and I started um, meeting not just socially but we would we set aside a day in the week when we would get together for two or three hours and discuss only spirituality, only these matters. And it was a great opportunity for me because I had read a lot of Buddhism, but I had never known a real Buddhist. I mean, someone who was completely dedicated and, and, and wasn't talking nonsense. And the two of us battled, we banged heads a lot and all this, but eventually, kind of in the way that you and I have, we found our own level of agreement. And on that level of agreement, Robert told me that I was a natural teacher of non-duality and should be doing that. Well, I know this is gonna be hard for um, younger people to understand, but I had never heard the word non-duality ever. <laughs> and I, I knew what he meant as soon as he said it, but th this non-duality fad actually started in the 1990s. Before then, that word hardly appeared. I know this because I've checked it out on Google. There's a way you can see the word frequency. And when I looked it up, non-duality goes like this, there's none of it. And then suddenly in the mid nineties, it goes like this. And it becomes this tremendous fad all over the world. And um, part of my critique of spirituality is, um, Regard, it, it regards that, that fad as a kind of rat poison. So that I have people asking me how they can realize non-duality, as if there, there'd be an answer to that question. And there isn't. I mean... It, it seems to me that we, that we, you know, we have those kinds of misunderstandings until we don't, you know, that we, you know, it's like when I first 
I mean, unlike you, I mean, I've sort of been into spirituality my whole life, you know, kind of feeling a strong, I just have always had a strong, what is it? I don't know, feeling, I would say it's a feeling for the, for the sacredness uh, of life or something. It's something, and I, ritual to me is a kind of celebration or something. So it's, it's always been there for me. And so it's gone through many different forms, but, and it was a period of time where I was a political leftist and I really wasn't, you know, that was for that, the, the left at the time anyway, completely looked down on spirituality. So I was like, you know, I, I was not in it for a while, but, but it was always there, you know, and the question, it feels to me like we have these misunderstandings. So like when I first got into Zen, you know, I mean, it was like, one of the first things I heard was this is it. And, you know, my response was, this can't be it, <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, for a long time. And then there was a period where I was like really seeking enlightenment. And I knew intellectually that somehow, you know, I had gotten the message intellectually that somehow that was night, that was a little off, but I was still seeking enlightenment. And there were all these teachers that were saying, seemed to be saying that they were enlightened or that they were awake in some way that I wasn't. And so I was chasing that. I was chasing that. And then at some point, it just really got clear to me, wait a minute, this is all about me. <laughs> you know, it's all about me getting some experience. And it just kind of fell away, not because I decided, oh, now I'm enlightened. Um, and not because I decided, oh, there's no such thing. I mean, it's kind of paradoxical. There is and there isn't. And it's, you know, but, but just, it just fell away. It's more like you kind of see through the the false ideas or the illusions. And if you're lucky, you don't pick up new illusions to replace the false illusions that you're seeing through or deconstructing. I think that's sort of, for me, the heart of it is to sort of see through and deconstruct rather than grab onto and make something out of, you know, make something out of nothing that we can now put on the altar again or something. So it's like, but it seems like we just do have these misunderstandings, like people wanting to experience non-duality. Well, of course, you know, it's not an experience. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, it, it, it's an absurd thing, but it's like you kind of, people have these ideas until they don't, you know, it's kind of like you have to see through these things in your own way, in your own. Yes. So that, that, that came up for me just a moment ago when you were saying that, that you were more of the Bhakti type, you like. Uh, ritual and and chanting and all of these things that's a question of personality and we all have one and this is another thing that that a lot of spirituality tries to deny or belittle but i don't do that at all uh, personality is extremely important it, it has a real meaning in our lives we each one of us has a little different road to hoe and that's what makes it interesting. Yeah, and I think, you know, I was, I do have, I'm not really a bhakti type, but I do have a bhakti streak. And I suppressed it for many years because it was like, you know, like in the, in the, and Tony Packer was, you know, she was very much in the same camp with Krishnamurti. I mean, she was like, she had no use for religion or God or relig ritual or any of that stuff. What? And, she was like me? Yeah. <laughs> It's a lot like you in that way. And, and, and so, you know, there was my years with Tony and then there was, you know, the left, the political left, which of course regarded all that as bullshit. And, and so for years I was kind of suppressing this bhakti side in me, you know, that, that would resonate with Rumi and this kind of thing. And, uh, and then when it finally, Gangaji, it was actually my relationship with Gangaji that sort of opened it up for me. And, uh, and I'm, I'm eternally grateful for that because it was like opening some kind of heart opening that, um, that, and yeah, it can take some weird forms that maybe aren't so good, but, 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 um, but there's something there that for me feels rich and, 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 and it is maybe just personality, you know, that, 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 you know, I love Tony and you and Krishnamurti being exactly the way you are, you know, I wouldn't, you know, that's perfect. And then I also love Rumi and, and, um, and Muji and these more devotional kinds of expressions. Yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with any of it. That's what I'm saying. I mean, yeah. each one of us seems to require certain experiences in life and they're not the same for everyone. 
uh -huh. not at all. And yeah. It's not one size fits all. And that's, that's one reason that I, that I try to encourage people not to be followers. Don't be a follower of anyone. You're, you're, you're just giving away too much. Try to find out what it is that you really want to know and experience and, and try to chase that down wherever that may lead. And, and don't put these people up on a throne. They, they don't belong there. They really don't belong there. I mean, and it's, it's so easy to do too. I mean, it's like with even with, you know, like one of the things we kind of discovered at Springwater where the intention, Tony's place, the intention was to, you know, kind of, she didn't want to, she didn't use the word teacher. She didn't want to be seen that way. She, you know, wanted to eliminate all the kind of authoritarian structure of Zen and blah, blah, blah. And yet what we discovered was we kind of bring it along inside of us, you know, so it was like people were still you know, holding her up as an authority, even as she was knocking that down and saying, don't do that, you know, or something. And, and even though Springwater is one of the probably the most open place I've ever been um, spiritually, it also, there's a very kind of, there's the Springwater way. And, and, you know, if you, like when I gave a retreat there a few years ago, the one and only time, you know, I, it was, you know, some people loved it and some people, you know, it was clear that I had deviated a little bit. And, you know, so it's interesting how even, you know, we can even, you know, turn people like you into, or me into, into, um, you know, gurus or something in our mind. Yeah, well, I've just, I've just had an object lesson in the last few months with that because, I, I, I have no desire at all to be in that position, not mm -hmm. at all. And I even did everything that I could think of to discourage people from putting me in that position, but it happened anyway. And that's really, I've had a couple of letters this week asking about why am I not doing these group Zoom meetings anymore? That's why. Um, that was beginning to um, coalesce in a way that I found very discouraging because it's the opposite of what I'm trying to to communicate. And that's why I, I did this meeting with Tom Thompson last month and why I'm doing this with you and I will do it with John Aston. Um, in that way, I'm not the special one in the Zoom meeting. We've got two people here who have, a, have an idea which way is up. And that's what we're going to discuss, not how can I be like Robert, which is, see, that's what that, because I'm, because I'm um, intelligent and speak well and wrote a book, and because I've said I find myself awake, instantly that, go, that turns into something that I never intended for it to turn into. I mean, that does not make me special. None of, there's, there's a lot of human beings on this planet, billions, and there's plenty of them have a very good idea of what we're discussing here. I meet them. And there's not really anything that special about Robert or well, any, or any of us. There is and there isn't, though. Because yeah, that's right. There is. It's a paradox because, you know, it's like you... Um, well, you and your book have had a very powerful impact on me. I mean, Tony Packer is one of the clearest human beings I ever met. I mean, she had a huge impact on me and she continues to have it, you know? I mean, it's like, so she wasn't, and you, like it, the mistake is seems to be, you know, sort of turning, thinking, I mean, Tony was always saying like, that whatever she said was not said as an authoritative statement and that it was always open to being questioned and, you know, disagreed with and taken further and overturned and you know she had a lot of sort of scientific background she was raised by scientists and her husband was a scientist so she had kind of a scientific approach to all this mm -hmm. and um, so she you, you know that to me is sort of it's it's our human tendency to you know want we want something you know it seems to be there's this because we want security and and, and control and all that so we can survive we tend to want something that we can hang on to you know we want we want the answer we want certainty we want something and and then we want to turn you know we want the spiritual teacher to be you know a parent figure or or some all-knowing deity with the answers you know who can tell me what to do and all that 
and 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 so many teachers either consciously or unconsciously feed into that um you know you and tony packer and hopefully myself and and you know a number of people are in the you know constantly undermining that but um it's an interesting question like how do you you know because you obviously have a an urge to communicate all this, which I think is great because it's, I think it's very much needed. And I, well, I hope you do keep communicating it. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and I do too, but I'm always at a sort of, I'm never really happy with any of the forms. Like I've experimented with a lot of different forms for meetings in the whatever, 20, 30 years I've been doing this. I don't know how long. Um, and I've never been really happy with any of them. You know, I've tried the sort of satsang format where I'm at the front of the room and people are asking me questions and I've tried the circle, sitting in a circle and having just an open discussion. And I've tried like a lot of different forms and none of them really feel satisfactory to me. Um, so it's kind of for me an open question, you know, how to, I like my individual meetings with people. I think that's what I enjoy the most and, and, and writing. Uh, but um, you know how to how to sort of communicate all this is, um, and I don't think there's just one answer, or one way. It's you know, but it's an interesting question. Yeah, well, I've been I've been trying out various ways. I haven't found anything totally satisfactory. Um, I I certainly intend to continue with this in, right. in one way or another, and I'll tell you why. I I was touched by two people through only through reading deeply touched and deeply redirected in a in a very positive way one was jiddu krishnamurti when i discovered krishnamurti it was i found this book in, in the back of an old bookshop in new york it was called early talks it was a really cheaply printed book from india and i i started reading the book and I sat in the bookshop for I don't know how many hours, read it from cover to cover, and then took the book with me everywhere for the next few months and just immersed myself in it. And the other one was Alan Watts, mm. who, who just spoke so well on, on these matters without making any claims about being a realized being or, or uh, whatever. Well, I understand mortality. And I understand that the way the wheel turns, I have to do this because it was done. So people have to occupy these roles. Mm -hmm. And I now understand that those two men that I mentioned suffered a great deal to occupy those roles. Now I understand that. Krishnamurti used to say that all the time, don't make a God out of me, all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. And I, I, that wasn't false modesty. He really meant it. Mm -hmm. I think he really understood what it is to be human and mortal. And you're, we're not getting out of this alive. I mean, it's not like Robert has the, the, the philosopher's stone or something. It's not like that. <laughs> it's just not like that. And I'm, I'm just going to keep discouraging people from trying to put me in that role. Um, but at the same time, I understand um, that I have something to to share, and I'm going to do it if I can, as best I can. Um, I see you doing the same thing. I see you doing exactly what I'm doing in your way. You, you come to an understanding that's very valuable. I know it is. Other people do too. And so you have to write a book or give a talk or whatever it is. I mean, otherwise it will just die. It will die. If nobody shares this, it, it won't be any. And, and really, really crucial to me is that I don't feel like it's, you know, I don't feel like I've come to some final understanding or something. I don't feel like, um, I don't feel like there is a finish line or a final understanding or something. You know, I feel like I'm always, well, like I just described what the last year has been like for me. I mean, it's like, it keeps opening up. It keeps unfolding. It keeps, mm -hmm. it keeps revealing itself. It keeps changing. And so it's not, I keep seeing new things. It's not, or, or I keep seeing, sometimes it feels like I'm seeing, getting the same basic lesson, you know, over and over again in clearer, deeper, subtler ways or something, you know, like this is it. Like I keep getting that deeper and deeper, but, but it, it doesn't feel like there's a sort of final landing place. It feels like it's very alive. And, and I think 
it's very alive in meeting in like like the fact that you and I have become friends. It's very alive in that meeting. You know, it's like it's it's alive in in um, or reading even reading a book like reading Alan Alan Watts was you know really inst I mean he was sort of the beginning for me in the 1960s in college when his books were coming out and I was reading them and and got me into Zen and all that. Mm -hmm. um, well, so there's another place we agree that awakening never ends. Right. It's yeah. not that you, you suddenly made it to the end of the trail and somebody puts a crown on your head or something. <laughs> it's not like that. And, and yet it's strange, but that's what people believe. Well, and, and a lot of teachers put, do put that out there. Is well, they do. And, you know, them? you mentioned Rupert, and I've been critical of him recently, although I've never met him, and he seems like a, a nice person. So my critique is not personal. But he certainly does come off that way. He knows, and how he knows is higher reasoning. He developed this capacity that the poor yokels in the audience do not have. And so speaking from that point of view, he will now instruct everyone. And I just find that shocking. I really do. I, I can't watch it. And I know you and I went around about this a few times because, you know, you like him and you know him personally. If I knew him personally, I might be more disposed to uh, cutting him some slack. I admit that. But well, I, I find that transaction um, poisonous. Yeah, There's nothing good about it. There's nothing good about it, in my view. It, see, it could seem good because some of the things he says are good. Mm -hmm. But when you mix this other stuff into it, then you get the hypnotic trance. And mm -hmm. he has hypnotized countless people. I've spoken with them, many of them. Mm -hmm. They're hypnotized. They, they believe that Rupert has attained self-realization, which is just what you and I were saying doesn't really exist. There's no end to it. Yes, whatever the self is, let's try to find out about it. But don't imagine that you you are now a realized being who is now going to sit here and explain life to everyone you meet. I mean, it's absurd. And yet, I, I don't blame these people because I, I felt it. I felt that pressure happening to me. I, I, but I, you know, there's no danger there because I, I, I'm not attracted to that role in any way. But, but I don't, I don't blame them. They do. They start out with something to teach, is what I believe, that worked for them, made them feel very happy inside and all that, which is beautiful. There's nothing wrong with it. They start teaching, and if you have a nice personality like like Rupert, if you're nice looking and gentle, and you have a beautiful voice, you sit there and hypnotize people and they come back and pay you again. It, the whole thing is very self-sustaining and it's really nobody's fault. Well, and I have to acknowledge that, you know, within myself, I mean, I did have an ambition to be a spiritual teacher. I mean, I kind of had ever since childhood, a vision of myself doing something spiritual, being a monk or being a minister or being, a, you know, it took different forms, a Zen priest. And then it was a satsang teacher at some point. And, you know, I, did have a kind of ambition about being a spiritual teacher and I kind of, you know, there was sort of me in it. There was a self-image concern in it that I could mm. see and feel. And, uh, and there was a kind of desire to be and a kind of getting off on being the one in the know, you know, being the one with the answers. I could feel in myself both the desire for someone in the know, you know, someone to tell me what to do and the desire to be that person and to sort of be at the front of the room and have the answers. Mm -hmm. and, um, so, and I have a feeling that those are very common human uh, desires in that um, I'm probably not alone in having felt those things, but, um, and I was very lucky to have a teacher like Tony Packer and Joko Beck, who was another one of my Zen, a Zen teacher of mine, um, who I know you like, Charlotte Joko Beck. Oh, another, I, really, I really love her. She's so good. I know, very, but I was very lucky to have those two as my teachers early on because they were so clear about seeing that kind of stuff in yourself. And, and um, you know, seeing these kinds of 
um, self images and and desires of this kind of or the other. So, uh, but I think a lot of people who haven't had those kinds of teachers maybe um, maybe just get carried away with that and they don't see that that's what's going on to some degree. Yeah. And, you know, I don't want to get into a thing about Rupert because, you know, no. I, mean, I like Rupert very much as a human being. He's a very generous, lovely person. And I, yeah, I, and I, and I don't think he, I've never heard him say that he's enlightened or awakened or that anyone else isn't. And he, he does have a very experiential approach, which I really like of sort of leading people through direct contemplation. But I completely agree with you. He also has this metaphysical leap through higher reasoning and he does teach in this this format of I'm the one with the answers and you're the one with the questions and I'm going to dispense the truth. He does do that. And I agree with you that it's um, it's not, I don't find it to be a, uh, it's not a way of, of, it's not a way of doing this that attracts me at all anymore, either from either side. I don't want to be the teacher in that way and I don't want to be the student in that way. It doesn't yeah. I didn't mean to indict Rupert. I mean, he seems like a perfectly nice person, and I think he's generous of spirit also, and which is a beautiful quality. So mm -hmm. let's say some nice things about him also. I, I think you are a spiritual teacher. I consider you a spiritual teacher, and I consider that you are doing it in the right way. And there aren't that many people doing it in the right way. That's what attracts me to your work so much. I'm going to hold it up again. Everyone should read this. This book is filled with personal anecdotes that take the, the I'm already there aspect out of it entirely. This is a, a ruthless self-examination in this book, and it's, it's done in a really beautiful way. Um, well, thank you, and it's, and it's interesting that I don't, I don't consider myself a teacher. I mean, I don't feel like a teacher, and it, you know, Tony Packer, when she, I, I used to argue with her about it and, and tell her that she was in denial, that she was a teacher, and why was she pretending not to be? And, and then when I started doing this, it's like, if I could just, I don't, I never think of the people I talk to as my students. I never have the sense that I know what somebody else That's needs. right. That's I don't feel like, oh, I, I want to guide you because I know what you need to do next. You know, I can see where you're stuck and I need to get you to the next level or something. I mean, I just don't have that perspective. And I really genuinely feel like we're all in this together. Like we're all in this. Well, so you, you were mentioning um, this need that you, that you once had to be the one in the know. Um, I've had that too. And I, I worked that out as a psychotherapist. Um, <laughs> I mean, a, a, a psychotherapist is a tremendous authority figure if you really consider what it is people come in and strip naked they tell you all their secrets and want your advice basically is the transaction and I got into some ego trips about that for a while myself I think the thing that straightened it out for me was I started to realize that I was learning as much as my clients were uh -huh. and so this is actually a transaction between two intelligent people not Robert the great healer or something it's just not like that so I think by the time I got to this aspect of it that was pretty much calmed down those needs are pretty much you know fulfilled maybe or, or um, but I I've asked myself if what I'm doing is spiritual teaching because people keep saying it is and maybe it is I think the only thing that I really have to teach is a takeaway. It's not an, it's not an adding, it's a takeaway where I say, let's, yeah, I know all about that. You know all about non-duality. Yeah. Okay. Let's set it all aside. Pretend that we don't know anything about all that for the rest of the afternoon. Let's just breathe and look out at the world and then see where you are without all those ideas. And I think that that's really helpful to oh, yes. to not be pursuing the next carrot that the, I, you know, I have three donkeys and I can get them to do anything I want with a carrot in my hand, <laughs> anything. <laughs> and that's the way that a lot of um, students are being treated by their teachers. Not Rupert. Yeah. He doesn't, he, I'm not saying he does that. He doesn't do that. 
but there are a lot a lot of these people who are more mercenary and all the rest of it um i i go to their websites it's really shocking there's a whole schedule of payments and how much it costs per half hour to talk to one of these guys on it well i charge i charge money for my i now call them conversations with people yeah but it's, it's okay to make a living i see i i think I think this is a very difficult subject. Money is a difficult sp subject anyway for most yes. of us. Spiritually, but, it's like, you know, it's long been considered sort of evil or unspiritual or whatever. Yeah, no, I, I think it's fine to make a living, but the product has to be something valuable, not just some chit chat that you learn from Nisargadatta or something. That's, that's anyone who charges for that is a thief. If you want to work with someone and take your time and your your own thought, your own blood, and put it into that situation, and that's how you're going to pay for your groceries, I see nothing wrong with that at all. At all. Zero. There's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with writing a book and selling it. Nothing. Yeah. I mean, that's just the way of the world. It what, is. What makes, uh -oh. what makes it wrong to me is selling someone else's ideas as if they were yours. It's like, and I don't, I also feel like I end up, what happens in the dynamic a lot with you and some of your quote followers <laughs> is that, uh, is that I end up, they end up attacking people like Rupert and Muji and everybody and I end up sort of defending them. And, and in fact, I agree with a lot of the criticisms, you know, you know, I feel like there's so many different ways that we can, that we can approach, that's not quite the right word, but that we can be with. That's not the right word either. <laughs> no word is the right word. Um, but there's so many ways of sort of looking into, that's not the right word. What is? You know, and like, like John Aston, for example, is recently really emphasizing the kind of, and I have done this a lot in my work, really emphasizing the kind of just um, pure sensory experiencing. You know, just the, just the sensory experiencing of the moment. Sounds, the sound of traffic, the sensations in the body, the breathing, the pure, bare sensory experiencing without the, without the conceptual overlay. So that's one thing. And I, and I think, you know, one thing that I'm really kind of moving away from is getting fixated on any one particular way of doing it, you know, because that's beautiful and that's for me been very important in sort of coming into the body and seeing seeing fluidity feeling fluidity and impermanence and all that and at the same time there's something beautiful in in movies and stories and myths you know so it's like i it it's not like i want to abandon um telling stories or uh or other, I guess I'm trying to say there's different layers, different layers of reality or something. That isn't the right word, but um, you know, there's there's just, and there's no one way to sort of see it or look at it, you know. And it feels to me beautiful to kind of be able to move between these different ways of of seeing it, you know, that I can appreciate it as pure pure sensation. And I can appreciate watching a good movie that's telling a story with a narrative. And um, do you know what I mean? Of, yeah. course, of course I know what you mean. Yeah. Um, I like movies too. They're, 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 they're magical. You're transported immediately yeah. with some other, into some other frame, which I, I really like. Um, I think that there's a lot of, I don't really want to use the word levels, but I, I guess it's unavoidable in, in a sense. There, there's different ways of approaching the fact of being here, which is what all of this is about after all. Um, we find ourselves here, now what? Yeah. <laughs> that's, the initial, that's the initial question. Um, for a lot of people, it's self-improvement. And I don't mean that in a trivial way. I mean, there might be someone whose ambition it is to speak seven or eight languages, and, and we'll work on that every day. I, I, I work on Spanish every day con consciously, and it's a self-improvement project. I want to get, 
I want Robert to be better at his second language. And so I wonder, and you've written about this, um, it, it's in, there's, there's something about self-improvement in Nothing to Grasp, which I, I found interesting. So I wonder what you would say about that now, about self-improvement, because it's something that people ask me about a lot. Well, the title of the book I've been working on for a really long time is uh, Death, the End of Self-Improvement. <laughs> Great title. And, uh, but I'm not against self-improvement in the way that you're speaking of it. I mean, it's, it's, I think it's beautiful to, you know, be um, practicing and improving one's Spanish or, or one's language skills or, um, or, you know, I go to the gym to try to build up my body and keep it in good shape, you know. Um, there's, there's, so it's not that I'm against that kind of quote self-improvement. I think what the, what the title of my book and what my critique of self-improvement is pointing to a questioning our, our kind of our curative fantasies, our, our, our ideas, uh, transcendent, our kind of urge the kind of idea we have that this is not okay the way it is. I'm not okay. Life is not okay. The universe is not okay. And we need to fix it. And of course, on one level, there's some truth to that. I mean, you know, I'm, I think it was wonderful that we've had a civil rights movement and a gay liberation movement and a women's movement. I mean, you know, I'm not saying we should just sit here and not do anything, but it's kind of, it has to do with kind of how we're thinking about it, how we're looking at it. Um, are we imagining that we're going to get to utopia someday, that we're going to, that, that we're going to get to a place where me is finally perfected and okay and fixed at last and, and the world is finally fixed at last and, and, you know, because that is a fantasy, that's not going to happen. And, and part of what's so liber been so liberating and for me about, you know, is just being okay with how it is, you know, like I still have this finger biting compulsion and I'm okay with it. I mean, yeah, it'd be nice if it went away and maybe it will and maybe it won't, but if I'm doing it on my deathbed, I'm okay with it. I don't have, feel shame anymore or feel like I've got to fix this or it means that I'm a failure spiritually or anything like that. Um, and, and so that's the kind of self-improvement that I'm, that I would kind of question. Mm -hmm. perfectionism perfectionism and and you know like the kind of thought that i'm not going to be okay unless i can get rid of this compulsion mm -hmm. or you know like alan watts was an alcoholic i mean he was apparently dead drunk when he gave a lot of those those radio talks and stuff and 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 yet he was a wonderful incredibly brilliant beautiful you know and that's just part of who he was and and I think he, you know, maybe he went through periods of sober. I don't know his whole history, but I mean, you know, lots of people, nobody's perfect. I mean, we all have these human flaws and stuff and, and neurosis and this and that. And, yeah. and it's, um, and yes, it's, it's fine to like do what we can. I mean, you know, I, I'm all for recovering from alcoholism. If you can, I'm all for it. I mean, I, I, you know, but, um, but on the other hand, it's kind of like it is the way it is. Well, one of one of the one of the the points that you made in Nothing to Grasp, which I like so much about alcoholism and about your your experiences with drinking, was that the drinking stopped, and then it started up again, and then it stopped, and you said throughout the whole thing that you actually didn't don't know what made it stop or start up again or stop that that was the experience but there's really not an explanation and I yeah i mean you can, you can put an explanation on it after the fact yes. um, yeah and and, and there's some partial truth in it but you we really there it's like the whole universe is coming together as this moment you know we don't really know our stories are kind of after the fact and it's like, and it's really taught me how, you know, like I may get back into transcendent spirituality, you know, six months from now, you know, I've really kind of learned the danger of announcing <laughs> that, you know, I am done with this forever. Mm -hmm. um, wow. That's because I've seen that 
that, you know, things can come back. In fact, I remember years ago, I was on the phone with Joko Beck talking about, you know, how I kept getting involved with all these different gurus. And I said to Joko, I hope I don't do this again. And she said, you might. <laughs> <laughs> like, no problem, you might. <laughs> <laughs> that's, right. that's funny. That's funny. Yeah, anything can happen. It's yeah. that's really true. And We're, it's not really a problem. Like if that happens, then that'll just be grist for the mill. It'll be like you know, it'll be. Um, it just be because you know the things like I'm really grateful that I that I was a drunk and that I have a finger biting compulsion because I've learned a lot from it. I mean, I wouldn't recommend it, but. Let's, it's like I'm grateful for cancer. I'm grateful for having been born with one hand, you know, because all of these things have, have been sources of, of insight and compassion and wisdom. And wow, that's such a powerful statement. That is a really powerful statement you just made. It's um, true. Well, you know, grat you know, I mean, yeah. grat you gratitude, gratitude is the greatest. It's the universal solvent. Yeah. Nothing can really, nothing bad can really stand up to it. I'm, as I, as we were talking about, I've had some physical suffering quite a bit, actually, and oh. and um, but I'm still happy and grateful for this opportunity. For for, I'm I'm grateful that there's something rather than nothing. Yeah. Really, I mean, yeah. it's very simple. I know to say such a thing, but um, we get to be here. We get to play these mind games with each other and, and um, enjoy. I, I, um, I'm enjoying this conversation in a very deep way. It's, it's, I'm filled with a kind of satisfaction that, that we can carry on this way. And, you know, both of us are dealing with illness in one way or another, but we can still carry on. And that's really beautiful. Mm -hmm. So going back to what you were saying a moment ago, I think when, I think when people um, contemplate what I'm saying about being awake, um, they get frightened because it does imply that that no one is in control, and that's a hard one uh, to swallow. As you were saying, you might go back to transcendent spirituality again uh, that's it's true i don't i don't see that happening but don't you don't know we don't know what you I know <laughs> that i know that I, I i wouldn't i wouldn't predict it let's put it that way it seems like a it seems like a minor danger but it can't be ruled out i i totally agree with you and if it suits your purposes you'll grab it and run with it i mean that's just the way we all are if we hit on something that feels satisfactory we just lap it up. You know, that's, that's a human being. It could be sex, it could be knowledge, but if it, if it strikes you in the right way, you're just gonna grab it and, and, and that's, there's a kind of almost a greed, a, a kind of almost a greed in us to want what we want. We just really want what we want. And, and in some ways it's what, it's, what we, it's what we need, you know, it's like, like alcoholism was um, destructive in my life in many ways. I certainly, you know, did a lot of damage to myself and to other people. And, and, um, but at the same time, I, you know, I went to a lot of places that I would never go to sober. I did a lot of things that I would otherwise never have done. I, you know, it, it wasn't all bad. And the same with my, you know, the gurus and the transcendent spirituality. It opened up, like I was saying about the bhajans and the and the and the, you know, the the heart opening. There was there's something in there that's been good for me, that I would say something has to do with the heart opening of something, you know, and and so we. It's kind of like nothing is all good or bad, you know. It's like these things that seem like mistakes, are sometimes they have something in them that that we need that that we have to go through. Mm -hmm. So, you like that? well, I think I think part of part of the approach that I seem to um, bring to this, these matters is is non judgment. Yeah. I don't know if it's good or bad when it's <laughs> happening. 
Yeah. It's usually way after the fact that we that we appreciate the value of these experiences, not so much while they're occurring, especially if they're difficult and painful. It's pretty hard at that time to say, well, I just love having vaginal cancer. I mean, it's <laughs> just, such, this is helping me so much. And yet after the fact, you say, gee, I got something from that that's, you probably can't get that any other way. And I'm not saying, I, I'm not saying that I would wish that on anyone. I wouldn't. But on the other hand, as you say, it's not all bad. There's some wisdom that comes along with that suffering, and that's undeniable. It's like my finger biting compulsion has been for me. I, I, it's, I, it, it's made it absolutely clear that we don't have control. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, if I hadn't had it. I often say this, you know, because I did successfully, even though I had a little relapse, but I did successfully stop drinking and I did successfully stop smoking cigarettes. And uh, and so if I hadn't had this finger biting compulsion, I think I would have come to the conclusion that, um, you know, that, that we can choose to stop. And, um, and the finger biting compulsion has really shown me that, um, yeah, we can choose to stop when we can. <laughs> you know, we want to stop when we want to stop. And mm -hmm. we want another cigarette when we want another cigarette. And we're not in control of what want and what ability comes up in any given moment. There is no... You know, it's made that just crystal clear for me. Yeah, me too. I, I don't even try to be in control. I, I, when I, when I, you know, I realized that I really bit off a lot when I said I was awake. You're not really supposed to say that. <laughs> but, but, the, but the fact is that I really do find myself awake. And part of that is understanding that I'm not do the doer. It's easy to say that, but I really feel that way all the time, morning, noon, and night. That this, it's all arising in this in, inconceivable complexity. My paltry intelligence couldn't manage one gram of that, much less an entire universe. It, all of this is arising, and we're just astounded by it. If we have any sense, we're just astounded by it. To, to imagine you're going to be in control of that is just impossible. Mm -hmm. And yet that's, that seems to be the heart's desire of a lot of people is to get a tight rein on it and, you know, don't let anything bad happen. But, yeah, and, and I have to confess, I am a control freak. And <laughs> I do have a strong <laughs> controlling streak. Um, but it's like that too is not in my control. I mean, it's just kind of like... Uh, you know, I find myself uh, sometimes trying to control the situation. Um, it's just yeah, it's a hall. It's a hall of mirrors, Joan, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. That's what it really <laughs> is. There's this. this it, it's so. Uh, it's really amazing how little we know and how big this universe is. It really is. It's uh -huh. huge, and and I, I think that's. When you know when when I say awakening never ends, or or you said we don't get to the finish line, th that there is no finish line yeah. that yeah. we know of. I mean, it, if it's not as if there's a mapped out finish line, and if you get there and now you're done. Yeah. Although, that's what a lot of people who are spiritual seekers believe. They really do. Oh yeah. If I. You know, I, I, I'm constantly trying to um, help people to see that, that this idea of enlightenment or self-realization or whatever you want to call it, that's, a, that's just a uh, will-o'-the-wisp. It's, it's, a, it's a, a mirage. It's a fantasy. Yes, if you have a stone in your shoe and it hurts, you should stop and remove the stone from your shoe and keep walking, and that will be spiritual progress, metaphorically your foot won't hurt anymore. But that doesn't mean that everything is just hunky dory. There'll be some someplace else where it hurts or some other difficulty. And we're always going to be in this in this situation. There's not yeah. going to be a time for anybody when it's just all perfect. Right. We may feel that it's perfect, but if we do, that means that we have learned to accept 
whatever arises. Then, the then it's perfect. Perfection. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And so that's that should be an easy thing to communicate. I mean, I've just done it verbally, and I mean, you understand. It's easy for you to say it to you. But if I if I could really get that across to people in a, in a, in a deep way, so that it would be understood, I would feel very happy about that, very satisfied for people to realize there's no attainment. That the attainment is in the present. If you can attain being here in this moment, and accepting it for what it is, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and, and just say, wow, it's great. There's an opportunity to, to be alive. That's the best that, that I know how to do. I don't know anything else, really. And that's why I say I'm awake. And that's why I don't believe in these fantasies of spiritual perfection and transcendence. I just don't. If you go back to transcendence next week, OK. <laughs> I'll be okay with it. I'll well, you'll, have, you'll have to give me a you know a little whack if I do that. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll hit you with my whisk. <laughs> <laughs> I know I can count on you. <laughs> yeah, probably can. I feel like I could count on you too. You're one of those go-to people. If I was feeling very confused, I might want to get you on the telephone. Yeah. Well, and the thing is, you know, I mean, to me, it's like confusion is part of part of the, part of life. You know, confusion and uncertainty, and and like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, problems. It's part of life. It's like, it's like not like we get to some place where it's all figured out and resolved, and and uh, it's uh, and and. And it's just rich in so many ways, you know, it's like, and I think that's what I was trying to say before about different ways of seeing it or different levels. You know, like I read this thing on Facebook once, I think I wrote a post about it, but this guy, you know, there was like a picture of Donald Trump. And then his post was about how all this is just shapes and colors. Why are we upset about shapes and colors? And then there was another picture of, you know, a Ku Klux Klan rally or something. And again, this is just shapes and colors. Why are we upset about shapes and colors? Mm -hmm. And my reaction was, yes, that's part of the truth. I mean, that's part of like just seeing it as pure sensation and so on. And that's helpful. That's a piece of the truth that's helpful in sort of breaking out of taking the story completely, literally and seriously and etc. Mm -hmm. But if you get stuck there, you're missing another part of the truth, which is that that um, wait a minute, these things they they are real on a certain level, and they do matter and and so it's kind of like to me it's like not getting stuck anywhere but but um, yeah, being able to hold these different re see these move between these different realities or something I don't know well, that shapes and colors thing is like the movie screen analogy it yeah, it does point to something, but nobody's going to live in a, it no you know what I say to when people try that one out on me, I say, oh, really? Well, um, which would you rather have for lunch, tuna on rye or shit on rye? Yeah. <laughs> we are alive. Colors. <laughs> <laughs> well, no. It, so you, you're actually, uh, well, it's remarkable speaking to you this way. When you were talking before, I felt that I was looking right into your eyes and you were looking into mine. It's, the, it's just an illusion. I mean, you're looking into a camera and so am I, and we're not in the same room. But for a moment, the whole thing, uh, all, the, all the tech part disappeared. And I, I was listening to you, and I felt that our eyes had met. But and it's had. not a complete, I wouldn't say it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, uh, it's, a, it's an illusion. I mean, you know, it's like, we don't know what this whole thing is. I mean, we know that in some way it's all a construction of the brain and, and or maybe of consciousness, different theories, blah, blah, blah. But, but at the same time, there's an undeniable experiencing of the two of us having a meeting, having a conversation and a deep meeting and love and shared, you know, all of that and, and deeply looking into each other's eyes, you know, on, the, on, on every level, I don't mean just literally yeah physical eyes but 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 um yeah and it doesn't really matter 
is it all a brain construction or is it is it um, a dream in consciousness or all that you know it, those are things that people can get so caught up in and I can have gotten caught up in the times too but but it feels like they don't really it doesn't really matter it's 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 the aliveness of it is undeniable yes well the the dream and consciousness aspect um, leaves too much out that's the problem with that point of view you can say that but it doesn't account for a great deal of experience that all of us have so it doesn't really to, it, in other words to call to call what we're doing now a dream it's not really the right point of view on it um, I understand that it's like the movie screen analogy it's the same kind of thing where there that's a pointer and it, to, if the right person hears it at the right time, it might open a, a new vista. So I'm not, I'm not gainsaying it. It's valuable, but not, it's not valuable if you become a believer in that and carry it around with you at all times. That's not, that's, that's in my view, that's a, a poor approach to living. Very poor. What we really need to do is honor the people in our lives. We don't get that many of them. And when we have them and it's working, that's the time. Well, oh, I'm feeling sorry for myself right now. My dear friend is dying and I'm really going to miss him. I'm already mourning it. Mm -hmm. I'm already mourning it, Joan, because he's mostly not here anyway. Yeah. And so, yeah, you know. You told me. Yeah. That, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. so I, I, don't, I don't see that as a dream. I understand it can be seen as a dream. I get that, but I would prefer to see it as real, and 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 the grief as real. It's not dream grief. There may dream grief would be if I go to sleep tonight and dream and feel grief. That would be dream grief. In the, in the waking world, calling it dream grief is leaves too much out. Mm -hmm. it, it kind of forces people to become hard-hearted, which is another one of my critiques of spirituality. People explain away all kinds of suffering, especially other people's suffering, <laughs> by calling it a dream. Mm -hmm. And that's not, that's not really fair. If someone, well, I was a therapist for a long time, so I'm, I'm much more oriented to embracing suffering and helping people to embrace it. But if someone comes to me in pain, I'm not going to tell the person this is unreal. If I started talking like that, I'd, I'd be ashamed of myself. I mean, I hope I never do talk that way to someone who's experienced a loss. I think, you know, the, the, the yeah, um, the version of it that's kind of, grabbed me at times and that I've said at times is that um, is that we can't experience anything outside of our own consciousness outside of you know like you say experiencing is myself that's what myself is is yeah. this whole experiencing yeah. without without putting any words on it consciousness or or matter or anything but just whatever this is that's myself. That's and and I've often said, no two of us are seeing exactly the same movie of waking life. You know that mm -hmm. we're all, um, and yet and so you can get into sort of a perspective from that of we can't really know anything for certain. Like we had a conversation recently about whether we could know for certain that there was evolution. You know because all my experience of science and evolution and all of that happens in my experience and. But it kind of feels like we could, getting stuck there is, it is kind of, it feels like a, um, I can't put my finger on it because I think it's something I'm still exploring and looking at, but it, it feels like it's kind of a, it kind of leaves out the, I mean, yes, we're all, seeing from a different perspective or we're seeing a different movie in a certain sense but in, but at the same time we're looking deeply into each other's eyes we're speaking a common language we're picking up each other's um you know we're learning from each other we're we're 
you know, there's a what what I guess is called intersubjectivity or something. There's a you know there's a sharing going on that that and I can say, well, yes, it's just happening in my experiencing, and how can I know it's not just a dream? But that kind of um, It feels flat in a way. I don't know how to say it. Yeah, it Maybe just leaves out too much. This because what, it, what? Saying it's all a dream, just it just leaves out too much that's valid, that we actually experience. Yes, it's true. If you want to be totally logical, we don't know anything about anything, for sure. Mm -hmm. I could be a brain in a vat. Right. So, for, all, for all I know. No, seriously, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's kind of what, yeah. Dreaming, dreaming this body. Right. That's possible. It's unlikely, but possible. This could be a computer program running in the future, and none of us exists at all, except on ones and zeros. That's possible. Mm -hmm. But science doesn't go there. It, for science, um, evolution is about as factual as the earth revolves around the sun. It's just about the same. It's, it's so, there is so much evidence for it from so many different disciplines and it all agrees and boils down to this one basic idea. So yes, somebody can deny that. There's ways to deny it. You can say, I'm not talking about the, the Christian fools who try to... Right, no, we're talking about the more... The, we're, talking the about, we're talking about people with a subtlety of mind to appreciate. Right. Yeah, because the other kind of denial is just foolish. Right, we both agree we're not creationists and all that. Contradicts the Bible, <laughs> can't be true. No, right. leaving that aside, I'm talking about people who have a doubt that what we see is factual. Maybe it isn't. That's, that's quite true. But at some point, you can reserve that, but at some point you have to be on the playing field. And I do. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not writing a prescription here. I'm speaking personally. I have to be on the playing field dealing with what feels and seems real as best I can and hold this other, um, this other uh, existential viewpoint, you know, existential doubt viewpoint, that has to be bracketed. Mm -hmm. I don't forget about it, but there's not really a lot of work to get done there. Whatever work needed, whatever work I needed that point of view for has pretty much already been done mm -hmm. to, the, to the point where I have no idea who I am, no idea at all. I wake up in the morning, all this is here. Robert seems to be here. Most of his ideas that he had yesterday are also still here. And it's all a mystery. Go it ahead. is. It's a mystery. It's like, it's like, and we know like from brain science, we know that like what we're seeing is that in a large part, you know, it's a construction of, uh, you know, like whatever's, if there's, if, if there's something out there, it's not exactly what we're seeing. You know, like a fly sees it differently and a dog sees it differently. Yeah. And so it's not like there's some, you know, and that's helpful to sort of break up the sort of sense that we know what this is. It's, it's, it is like, we don't know what this is. And at the same time, as you say, we're functioning on the level of, you know, two people having a conversation and not like, you know, are you subatomic particles swirling around? You know, it's just, it's, 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 um, yeah, we have to be on the playing field, as you put it. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. And, and, yeah. And that, that involves not knowing, that involves embracing not knowing. That's the only way I know how to be on the field. Mm -hmm. See, someone might think, no, you have to take everything seriously. Otherwise, you're not, you're not really doing it. That's not what I'm saying. I, yeah. there's, I don't think you have, I think most of this does not have to be taken seriously. That's one of the good things that I like from Hindu religion is the idea of Leela. Yeah. Leela, which is play. 
divine play. And not knowing, like just looking at you and I don't know what you really are. I don't know what's really going on here. I don't know what this really is or what, you know, whatever that even means, what it really is. It, it's like, and that there's a sort of openness in that or just, you know, a, an openness in that. Yeah. And uh, it, takes the, it, it takes the idea that, that one is an expert on living completely right. out completely it just erases that We're, i'm not an expert on the art of living it's an art you have to keep on being artistic not think this is what you were saying before you don't get to the end now i know exactly who i am and exactly what to do next i've got it all figured out that's we have to we have to avoid that kind of certainty and yet that's the kind of certainty that millions of our friends are involved in. They're seeking that certainty, seeking it. And they feel that if they can find that certainty, everything will be all right. Yeah. And how can you tell such a person everything is all right now? <laughs> Not in a trivial way. I don't mean, oh. I don't mean that, that you didn't have uh, months with cancer. And now the aftermath. That's not all right, exactly. But it, but it has to be because yeah. that's it's what is. It's it's what is. I mean, I am cancer free now. Just in case I didn't say that, just so people are not worried that I'm. Yes, I, I I did know that about you. I did know that. But but I also know that the operations, you, the radiation you had, and all of that has actually changed the way that you have to live now. Oh, yeah. And the radiation continues to affect the tissue for years. So, you know, it will continue to change my yeah. situation. So, so that really happened. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. It's it's really same. as real as anything is. And it's, it's you know, it's, it's so like even tomorrow when we're looking back on this conversation, we have a memory of it. Um, you know, is that real or unreal? It's like, and the, you know, the past is like you can't really get hold of it in a way it's completely gone and in another sense it's not you can't deny it it's right here like you know i have these vivid memories of my mother my dog my you know what yeah. happened yesterday um it's like it's it's you can't land on one side or the other yeah really. i thought that was one of my better lines in um, the Ten Thousand things where i said people say that the past is is not real it's over and gone and the future is not real, it hasn't arrived yet. And I said, but the present isn't any, any um, more real than the past and the future because you can't get a grip on it. It's just- no, it's gone it, in a second. It's yes, it's falling through your fingers. So you, there's nothing you can do with it. There's, there's nothing you can do. We're actually, we're power, really we're actually we're powerless. It is we're so powerless. it's- these things sound so scary, like, you know, like there's nothing to grasp and we're powerless and, and, and there's no meaning and it just sounds scary. But when you're really just opening to it, it's actually incredibly freeing. It feels so liberating and delightful. And well, you know, that, that's where you and I agree entirely. And I think that's why we're such good friends, because that's, that's a secret. It's an open secret, but it's a secret. Someone has to kind of let you in on it. And how that happens, you've mentioned your teachers. I had the two guys I, I, I learned from in books, and I also had a living mentor uh -huh. who, who um, humiliated me, but in a good way. He, t he got me out of the high chair and down onto the ground, the ground of being. And we need that. We, and, and that's why we'll keep doing this, because people need that. Mm -hmm. And I... I tried to avoid this, but it started to feel like a, a unfair and unnecessary withholding. This was given to me. What am I supposed to do? Just take it, shut up, and take it to the grave? That doesn't seem that doesn't seem useful. And I, I realize now that my teacher Walter Chappelle, for whom I continue to feel great gratitude, he was an alcoholic oh. um, and a heavy smoker, and I had to suffer to hang out with him because I don't like to sit in a room full of cigarette smoke all night drinking cognac. But I did it because I wanted I because his words were pearls. 
And I think we need that. I think your work offers that to people. I think my work does. And I think John Aston, who I'm going to introduce soon, is another guy like that, another person like that, who really has something to offer. And people like that need to offer it. Otherwise, it doesn't get here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It doesn't just arrive. I mean, somebody has to, has to voice these words. And yeah. it's not personal. That, I think the secret to, to doing this in the right way, the way you're doing it, is it's, it's not personal. It's not that Joan is this superstar, is now going to enlighten everyone. It's not that. It's just that you have a clue. You really do. You have an idea. But really, you have an idea. And although we've said that we don't know anything, but within that not knowing, there is some, there's something to work with. Mm -hmm. So we have to, we have to not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yes, we have to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I got that gets a smile. Yeah, and yeah, and it's like it, it's interesting what you said about you know there's nothing personal because when we were talking before the before we started and you said something about nothing nothing is personal that you were um, not taking things personally. Um, yeah. And I think that um, that gets misunderstood a lot because it's not, it doesn't mean that we don't have a personality or that we don't care about a person or that we don't feel on some level like a person. It doesn't mean any of that. It's talking about not, like for example, not taking my finger biting compulsion personally means realizing that it's a happening of the universe. It's like the weather. It's it's, there's 10 million, uh, you know, everything in the whole universe being the way it is, mm -hmm. it's going up as my finger biting compulsion. It's not personal in the sense that it doesn't mean something about Joan. It doesn't mean I'm a spiritual failure. It doesn't mean, mm -hmm. and you know, the, similarly, the fact that, you know, you had your event where you were naked and laughing on the kitchen floor, um, awakening <laughs> or whatever, doesn't mean it, that's also not personal. It doesn't mean that, you know, you did that and that it means that Robert is now an enlightened one or an awakened one. Not at all. Already, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean um, that. No. It, it, so it, whichever side you look at, the so-called negative or the so-called positive, it's mm -hmm. like it's nothing personal in that sense, but it doesn't cancel out. In fact, my experience is that the more we're awake to the sort of bigger picture, the wholeness of it all, the, uh, the, the, the absence of a kind of solid, independent, separate self in the way we usually think of it. The more we're awake to that, the absence of boundaries, et cetera, et cetera, the more, act, the, more the, the person is actually free to express itself and be itself, you know, like be fully yourself. Cause it's like, you're the only Robert Saltzman that there is and you're absolutely unique and there's never going to be another one and there's never been one before. And it's like, you know, it would be a horrible thing if you spent your life trying to be Nisargadatta or Alan Watts or um, Eckhart Tolle or anybody else. You know, you're Robert Saltzman mm -hmm. and I'm Joan Tollefson. And it's like, you know, we spend such so much of our lives feeling like we're not okay and we're trying to be somebody else, you know? And it's like, um, so nothing personal doesn't mean abandoning personhood. I mean, actually it's, it allows that uniqueness to flower in my experience. Mm -hmm. So the way that I experience, I, I totally agree with what you just said. You said it very well. Um, the way that I experience nothing personal, it's like this. When the doctor told me that I had this rare disease, very rare, it's so rare that no one's researching it and there's no medications for it. And I'm borrowing the cancer medications. Um, um, when the doctor told me that, taking it personally would be, oh shit, why has this happened to me? You know, that's, that's taking it personally. The impersonal view is human beings are subject to illness. It happens to most of us sooner or later. This is my go with it. Right. See, and that's, that's a much more open-ended uh, embrace of, of the situation. And yes. 
yes, and these horrible teachings that are about, you know, you create your own reality and, and like if you're, if you have cancer or, 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 or not immune, autoimmune disease or something, it means that you, you know, you were, you weren't trying hard enough or you were, you were, you weren't thinking enough happy thoughts or you were eating the wrong food or you didn't exercise, you know, it, it, it's like those teachings feel so toxic to me. Oh, that's terrible. It's just a guilt trip. It, yeah. It's, it's, and it's not helpful. I mean, if, if there were some truth to it and hearing that truth would somehow help you to cure the cancer or whatever it is, okay, maybe I have to hear that. But all it is is a form of punishment that someone wants to lord it over you. They're, they're not sick, you are. And it's like, the, it's like these Protestants who used to, um, the thing that made heaven so great you see these, there's paintings like this. The, 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 um, the, the religious ones that are up in heaven, the, but the thing that made heaven so great is they're gazing down at hell and seeing the, the, the poor fools down there who, who you know, hadn't, hadn't been sufficiently, uh, sufficiently good enough in the eyes of God. And that, that, those are, wow, I just heard a big, Thunder, thunder. I heard, I heard something, but I didn't know what it was. Yeah, it we're in the hurricane. Or something like we're that. in the hurricane season down here. Anything oh. can happen. Anything can happen. Oh, well, this is such an amazing place to live because we're right in the alley where the hurricanes form, and um, we're already on the on the O's or the P's. We've already had like twenty events, but nothing's hit us yet. Uh huh. We had one in 2013 that wiped the whole town out, flattened it pretty much. Wow. Yeah, pretty interesting. Well, yeah, I'm living uh, on the edge of wildfires, so it's like... Uh, you had that smoke you've thing. Got, huh? You've got, you've got the, the possibility of wind and, and water and air sweeping you away, and I have the possibility of fire. <laughs> uh, that's right. It's like there's nowhere you can be safe. No. That's right. And it and there's no way that you can really be secure. There is no, no. security. There is no security in in living. No. And that's that's another thing that people like to avoid. Another another seeing or another idea that that people like to avoid. But we're laughing because it, and we, we mean it because when you embrace that, suddenly you understand. It's yeah. you. A, a world opens up. It's, and it's, it's, it's more real than the world in which you were trying to control everything. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that, you know, like I'm on the Cascadia earthquake fault also, which when they say when it happens and it's overdue, when it happens, mm -hmm. it will be the worst, national the worst natural disaster in U.S. history it's predicted to be when it happens. And so, you know, it doesn't mean that, that now I know that, or something. I'm I'm an awakened one, so therefore, if I'm crushed under the if the if the house lands on top of me and I'm still alive and I'm crushed under the house, <laughs> that I'm going to feel you know filled with bliss and joy. I mean, I might feel that. Who knows? But but more likely, I'll be screaming in pain or something. You know, it's like um, it's it's and it's it's sort of an okayness with that. It's like it's like. It doesn't matter. I mean, it, of course, I'd rather be filled with bliss than be screaming in pain. But it, it is, in the deepest sense, it, it doesn't, it, you know, they're both just what is kind of, you know, and I can't control it. I don't, I don't get to choose which one is going to arise. Exactly. You're not the doer. Yeah. So that, I think what both you and I encounter when we share these ideas is that this seems fairly obvious, but people don't like it. It's a very frightening idea to many people. And I've taken the radical, I've taken the radical road where I'll just say it, <laughs> but, but actually when, when I was uh, doing psychotherapy, I didn't just say it. it I, I, did, I did the exact opposite really of what I'm doing now. I didn't say anything radical. I just listened for a long time. And if I ask a question, it was only a very veiled suggestion that there might be 
something to look at over here. Now I just take your face and stick it right in the mess. And I just wonder, I, some people seem to like it. I mean, I, I do, I have a few fans, but it, it's, well, what I'm saying is you and I seem to be laughing and we're sanguine about our various ailments and no security and the house might fall on you and you're laughing. But I wonder what that's really like for people who hear that. Yeah, well, I find it very liberating and freeing, but I mean, I, I think it's, you know, when we're still caught in the idea that we want to get away from that, then it feels terrible. And of course, the flip side of what we're what we're kind of laughing about is that wonderful Mark Twain quote about I've been through many terrible things in my life, and some of them actually happen. <laughs> so it's like I can have all my fantasies about what it would be like to be crushed under the house in the Cascadia earthquake, but it may never even happen in my lifetime, you know. And and um, so and if it does happen, it won't be the way I imagined it. That's one thing I know for sure. It might be worse than I imagined, but it won't be the way I imagined it. Yeah, it's never the way we imagine it. It's never the way we imagine it. No, and, and somehow, you know, we make it through until we don't. And, um, you know, and... Uh, no one gets out alive. <laughs> yeah, and I'm, this, this may sound strange, but I'm actually grateful for death. Yeah. Very grateful. I really am. It's not that I look forward to it, but I'm not afraid of it either. And I think it's, it's perfect. That's what needs to happen. Otherwise, there'd just be too many bodies on this planet. We do, truly. You get, yeah. a life, you get a lifespan. We all get one. And I, I hope that you enjoy it while you have it and you can let it go when the time comes. Yeah, That's it, really the best. And it's the way of nature. You know, it's like, the old make way for the young. It's just part of like mm -hmm. these people who want to live forever, or be frozen and come back or something. It's just crazy to me. Oh, it's there's crazy. that's this that's this insanity going on in, uh, <laughs> in Northern California. The computer people are all wrapped up in this life extension stuff. Well, lots of people. I mean, it's it's a popular thing that people want to you know. They, live they forever. really mean it. Yeah, a lot of people are really into it. You know, it's yeah. like it's like. First of all, I think that would be sort of like I think part of the beauty of of life is that is its vulnerability and its fragility and its impermanence. Of course. And 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 we're actually dying moment to moment. It's not like just something that happens at the end. I mean, there's a big death at the end. Yeah. But but it's like I'm not afraid of it. I'm I'm sometimes I'm afraid of what comes before death if I think about it. <laughs> but again, it's not going to be the way I think it's going to be anyway. So Exactly. Yeah. There's no there's no reason to suffer from those fantasies. Just put them out of your mind is the best treatment for it. Yeah. I think. And we don't know. We don't know that. You could die a safe could fall on your head, you know, for all you know. Yeah. I mean that's the thing, you know, you don't know. Anything can happen. <laughs> 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 you see, I, I think it's beautiful. And the the other thing is this is another topic. It's about aesthetics, really. Um, uh, do you know Miriam Louisa? Yes, I love her. Of course you do. How could I say that? I'm, it's because I'm thinking about this conversation I had with her. Of course you know her. Um, well, we talked about this a little. She's a great person. I'm so glad I got to meet her. She's really a wonderful, great mind. Um, and an esthete, a true esthete, which I appreciate. I've been I Oh, yeah, that's okay. I've I didn't been, get the word, but I got it now. An esthete, yes, yes. That aesthetics. I've been accused of it myself, so <laughs> I, I like it. The, but the point that we got it to in our conversation is that without impermanence, all the beauty goes out of this. It's just repetitious. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you had to live for 10,000 years, really? Peanut butter and jelly again? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> that's, too, that's too long. See, and that's... So I don't know what the right lifespan is, but it's good that it, there is one because that's, that gives you the beauty. The beauty of loving another human. I've been married for a very long time. And part of the beauty is the impermanence. You realize we won't, this is going away. 
I can't, I can't keep this. I can't keep any of it mm -hmm. going away. You love that person. You want to be with that person. You hope that they don't die, except you know that, that they will. And, and that may seem sad in a way it is, but it brings this tremendous beauty to the situation that without this impermanence just wouldn't be there at all. Yeah. So our denial of impermanence, I'm saying, is actually very costly. It takes, oh, yeah. it takes a lot of the beauty out of life also. It does, and impermanence is actually, it is actually our freedom. It's actually, it's actually what, you know, it's impermanence is why every moment is fresh and new. Impermanence is why, you know, everything, it, it's, it's the aliveness of everything. Mm -hmm. Well, I wrote about this in the 10,000 things also. When, let's say I have a headache, then I love impermanence because <laughs> this too shall pass, you know, which is beautiful. <laughs> Except the real challenge is to take it, take it about everything, the things I like and the things I don't like. And yeah. then, you, then you're really dealing with something. And you're, then you're seeing things. Well, we were saying before, Joan, that we don't actually know this could be a dream and all of that. And I was saying, yeah, but you, you can't really live on that level very, very well. This is an example. Here we're talking about how one point of view leads to beauty and another point of view deals with fear and anxiety, constant fear. Right. And those, the, both the beauty and the anxiety may be just a dream, but I know which one I would rather have. <laughs> right, right. So if I'm dreaming, this is a, I, I locked into a good dream um, in this particular incarnation because in, in this dream, I'm um, okay with whatever comes up. I really am. I've already showed that to myself on a number of occasions, and now I just kind of take it for granted. And shit will happen, and that's okay. Robert, Robert likes that. May, may not like every ask, every detail of it, but the general picture of the, this, I'm not the doer, this is just flowing, and someday soon Robert will not be here anymore. That's kind of cool. I actually enjoy it. Yeah, me too, and I won't be here to know that I'm not here anymore. And, you know, that's, that's you know, that's, I think, people's fear of death is a lot about, you know, they think I'm still going to be here you know, be feeling like I can't get the TV back on and, and see what's next. And, or I'm still going to be here, but I'm going to be in heaven and I'm going to be looking down and I'm not going to be able to get back to my beloved, you know, wife or whatever, because I'm going to be in heaven. It, but it's all based on the idea that I'm still going to be here as Joan, you yeah. know, and, and it's so, it flies in the face of our own experience, you know, like when we are in deep sleep every night, there's no one left over who's worried about whether I'm going to wake up in the morning or not. Well, you see, you say that, and I agree with you. And I learned the same thing from my anesthesia experiences. Yeah, anesthesia too. Exactly the same thing. There's, there, there's no feeling of an interval at all. One minute you were counting backwards, and the next minute you wake up in the, on the gurney, and whoa, wow. And there's no feeling of that time passed. But, sure. but a lot of people don't, don't believe that. They... they there's all these claims by again by the spiritual teachers that there's a way of being aware of deep sleep and they like that because then it proves that this fixed thing undying thing is always there and it's always the same mm -hmm. you and i don't believe that do we no i mean it seems to me that well i mean i can't know what somebody's experience i mean i know people who say they've experienced deep sleep and my, my thought would be, how do you know you weren't dreaming? I mean, how do you know that wasn't dream sleep? Um, that you weren't dreaming, that you were experiencing deep sleep. And same thing with near-death experiences. I mean, I think they're real experiences, mm -hmm. but my guess is that they happen just as you're either losing or regaining consciousness, not when you're actually dead. And um, but I don't, you know, I can't really know any of that, but, but it, it, it's sort of like, I mean, I can't know that. I mean, obviously, when we're under anesthesia or we're 
asleep at night, there is still some consciousness or awareness there. We wouldn't hear the alarm clock in the morning or wake up if we smelled smoke. And, but it's, it's, not, it's not at the level of anything that we experience. And when we die, the brain is actually dead, which is a different thing. And, you know, and, it, and I guess I would say that in the same way that the, that the body is dying moment to moment, and when we die, you know, in nature anyway, goes back into the earth and the soil and other creatures eat it, it's like recycled. In the same way, maybe, maybe whatever this consciousness is also just is always change. It seems like, you know, I'm imbibing ideas from you, you're imbibing ideas, you know, we're, we're, we're having some kind of intersubject, intrasubjectivity or some kind of, you know, con shared consciousness, maybe, you know, but that to me, that doesn't add up to like, Joan is still going to be there as Joan, um, you know, experiencing my, you know, it just, I don't know what's going to happen after death. I don't think anyone really does, but, but I'm assuming it's going to be like going into deep sleep or going under anesthesia that I'm just going to feel things slipping away. And then I'm not going to be there anymore to be concerned that I'm not there anymore. Right. Okay. So we don't know that, but, but, don't we, know that. but we don't know that, but we assume it and, yeah. and we have, and we have good reasons to assume that. Um, the, the most basic reason is what's called in logic, Occam's razor. Right. Um, well, for those who don't know, Will, Willem of Occam was a 12th century character. And um, what he said is the simplest explanation is the best explanation. And we should not add layers of complexity to our explanations. So the simplest, I, I don't know this, and I would never sign off on it as if I did know. So with that as a preface, the simplest explanation is that when a baby is born with a living brain, awareness is there for that baby. And when that brain dies, there is no more awareness for that old, old person who was once the baby. It's over. That's the simplest explanation. Could be wrong. Maybe the immortal soul is conscious and you meet your grandmother in heaven and all that. It's possible. But, but I have, in, in looking inward, I don't find any, any immortal, I don't find a soul. I mean, I don't find anything that's sort of at the center of all this. I don't either. Other than a mental image or an idea or something like that, but I don't find anything actual in there, you right. know. And, right. uh, and, and actually, you know, if you look at it, like even what we're, anything we're talking about, bodies, nervous systems, brains, consciousness, anything we can mention, you know, if you, the more you look into it closely, it kind of dissolves, it, you know, into you can't really grasp what it is, you know, it's like, the, you know, you start looking at the brain with a high powered microscope, and it's just cells, and then there's molecules, and then there's atoms, or whatever order it comes in, and then there's subatomic quarks, or whatever, and then there's, you know, there, and it, you know, there's kind of like nothing there really, you know, and that's kind of mm -hmm. true of, of anything that we look at closely. Um, <clears throat> and he, and, and uh, more than 90% of the universe is invisible to us. Yeah. But it's, that's very interesting. More than 90% is invisible to us, but we are able to know in, in a sense that it's there by presumption from other facts. Um, while we were talking about science before, that's, that's how that works. For a scientist, a fact is not what spiritual people call truth. Right. A fact is a data point, and there's no good reason to not believe it, and a lot of reasons to believe it. But that doesn't mean that's 100% true. That so-called fact will be discarded if it, if later we learn something else that, that's a better that's a better fact and that's the beauty of the scientific method that it's always open to to being questioned and that's you know that to me was the beauty of the way tony taught you know and the beauty of what you're putting forward and the beauty of, beauty of you know this approach is to be um always open to seeing it all in a different way, seeing anew, seeing, seeing something we hadn't seen before. Beginner's mind. Beginner's mind, yeah. 
Well, that's a beautiful, I always love that phrase. That's, that's yeah. from Zen, right? It's Junryo Suzuki, Suzuki Roshi. He said, the, the secret of Zen is beginner's mind. And he said, you know, in the mind of the expert, there are few possibilities because the expert like thinks they know. But in the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities. Yeah, that's beautiful. Uh, and I feel like a child. In yeah. That. I, yeah. I do. I, I'm an old man, but I feel like a child in that way. Um, I really don't know. And I don't know myself. And I don't know where any of this is coming from or what any of it means. It's, it's, I draw a blank. And, and even though I, I, I'm able to discuss these matters in, in a, a way that I find useful to, my, to me, um, there's no real knowledge there at all. Yeah. There's only presumption and, and uh, interesting perspectives, but no, there's no firm facts. Yeah, and that's kind of the beauty of it, you know, that, that anything you look at, you know, it's like Joan. You can't deny there's something here called Joan, but you start looking at what is exactly is Joan, and you can't really get hold of anything. It's like, you know, it's the same way with anything, and it's just, that's the beauty of it, is that it's, it, it's not nothing, but it's, it's not anything you can really get hold of either. It's not anything solid. It's not anything. Yeah, that's right. So that's the Heart Sutra. It's not yeah. nothing. It's not nothing, but it's not something either. Right. That's really that's really a, a deep document. Um, I wrote about that a little in the Ten Thousand Things. Also, that's a that's a good thing for people to read. The Heart Sutra is a beautiful document. Um, it's not something to learn. I mean, it's not truth. It's it's um. It's a device for opening the space up. You understand, don't say there's nothing there. Something is there, but don't say that there's something there because you don't know what that is or how, how it got there. So it's not exactly something and it's not nothing either. Yeah. And that's, that's the viewpoint I have on Robert. Something's here, but I don't know what it is. And no one's going to tell me. Oh, that's, that's, that's the part. This is what I really would like to say to people who are spiritual seekers. And I know that there are some who are watching, who will be watching this on YouTube because that's, that's the kind of people who like to watch this kind of YouTube, <laughs> obviously. Um, well, I just lost the thread. I was... You said that's, that's what you really wanted to say to people, but I don't know what that is, and no one's going to tell me. Oh, no one's going to tell me. Yeah. That's what I want to say to the spiritual seekers. Do not approach another human being expecting to be told truth with a capital T. If you do, you're begging to be deceived. Whether that person intentionally deceives you for money or sex or power or recognition or unintentionally deceives you because she or he is uh, hypnotized or, or uh, caught up in, in beliefs, one way or another, you will end up wounded. Yeah. If you don't want to be wounded that way, don't expect to be told the truth. If you meet a wise person, make use of it in the right way. Find, find out what the wisdom is, not the truth. They're, they're not the same thing. Not at all. Not at all. And, and also, and just, you know, to be aware, I think it's just to be aware of that deep tendency in ourselves to want an answer, to want certainty, to want an authority. And, and to see that, you know, just to see how we that tendency we have to want to make something out of this, to want to cling to something. Uh -huh. it's a deep, deep tendency. And, you know, just to see it when it happens, you know, just to see it. And the seeing and is already, and Krishnamurti said this over and over, you know, the seeing it is itself the action. The seeing is the freeing. The seeing is the, you know, this, the, the, it, it feels so important to me just to see that, to see, not to not to pick up the belief, you know, that 
that now I've, I'm not doing that anymore or something, but to just really see that when it happens and not to, not to make you or me into an authority, not to, I think you said it so beautifully. I mean, just not to, not to go to any human being looking for the truth in that kind of way, mm -hmm. you know, and, and be, be aware of that tendency when it comes up, you know, to, yeah. to grab onto something and to, yeah. you know. Not, not, that, not, that, not that you, as you just said, that's an important thing you just said, not that you're done with this forever, but each time it comes up, yeah. leave it alone. Yeah, that's that's wisdom. That isn't truth. See, there, that's the wisdom. That's wisdom. But it, it says nothing about who I am or how did this all get here, which is the so-called truth. God made it. That's how it got here, or whatever it is. Yeah. If we avoid that and just stay with the wisdom part, then you find someone like Joan Tolleson, and you can just listen to what she's saying. It doesn't have to be truth. It's, it's, it's her account of what it's like to be Joan. It's just Joan babbling away. That, exactly. <laughs> exactly. We're, we're, this is a folie a do. It's a, it's a conversation for two idiots. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, you know, if, if we were little babies, you know, be like, ga 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 you know, on one level, kind of what we're doing. It's it's sweet. <laughs> but we've had fun doing it. This has been a great conversation. It has, Robert. And I just love you so much. And I love your book. And I hope people will will read your book and and uh, and not make it into an authority. And and uh, and I just so deeply appreciate what you're inviting everyone to question. And, and I so deeply appreciate the impact you, you are having and have had on my life. And oh, I love thank you, so you much. very thank much. You. Thank you so much for saying that, Joan. That's really beautiful to, for you to say that. Um, a lot of people are reading my book. It's amazing. I mean, I'm, it came as a surprise to me. The book's out there. Uh -huh. Strange, you know, it's being read. <laughs> well, I think a lot of people are, are, are hungry for what it offers. You know, I think a lot of people, um, mm -hmm. a lot of people are, because, you know, that, that other kind of spirituality isn't ultimately satisfying. I mean, it's temporarily satisfying in the sort of way that alcohol or cigarettes is temporarily satisfying. You know, it's, it's temporarily feels good and satisfying, but you know, it leaves you with a hangover. It leaves you with um, lung cancer. It leaves you with, you yeah. know, it leaves you, you know, needing another cigarette, needing another drink, needing another guru, needing That's another right. satsang. It leaves you, um, it ultimately doesn't, it doesn't ultimately satisfy the itch that you're trying to satisfy. You know, it just perpetuates it in some way. And what you're offering actually goes to the, to the root of the problem. Yeah. I'm so happy to be the author of that book. Yeah. And you're not really the author. That's no, the other I know. I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm nobody might as well commit suicide right now. <laughs>